You are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for hitting that play button. This is another episode of the Dave Bullis Podcast. Uh, really quickly, before we get to today's episode, I just want to say, for those of you asking, uh, the, uh, Podcast One actually did pass on my pitch. Uh, I actually pitched an original podcast series uh, just about stand-up comedy, and they didn't like it, so I'm going to try to repitch to them, and maybe even I'll pitch them this show. I, I don't know. It'd be pretty cool to see this show on Podcast One, but uh, I'm going to try to pitch them again, and uh, who knows? Who knows what will happen? And uh, one other quick thing before we get to today's episode is I put a link in the pre-show notes about YouTube and how everything has changed and how it's just a lot harder to make money on there now. Uh, basically, if you're not at the top, you're at the bottom, and you're not making any money at the bottom. Uh, and basically, the bottom is <laughs> everybody else, like 90 97, 98 percent, and then the top one or two percent are actually making money on there, especially after all these changes. So it's just a pretty, you know, interesting article. I uh, just found about, you know, because we're all putting all, all of our stuff on YouTube. Uh, it's just a way to get stuff out there. Uh, so that's why I don't want people to get lost in in thinking about monetization of, of a podcast or YouTube, but use that as a springboard for something else. Build an audience, and maybe you could make a short film. Maybe you could find investors that way just about building that audience because that's that's the new thing by the way is making sure you have a, a keyed in audience and that's why you see all these books and these movies and these superhero properties and why, that's why people keep doing that it's because that has a built in audience and that's what it's, that's what's attracting people nowadays uh, especially when you go to Hollywood or looking for for top level investors but again Never be afraid to put your, your, your work on YouTube if you're proud of it um, or even if you're looking for advice or critiques or what have you. Uh, and I'm going to go chat with uh, with somebody this on this week's podcast just about that stuff. You know, I actually uh, met my podcast guest through the power of Twitter, and he and I got to talking. And uh, on this episode, I actually found out that I actually inspired him to start his own podcast, which is the Filmmakers Podcast. Uh, You know, I am just blown away that I inspire people uh, in any way, shape, or form. You know, this podcast started four years ago, almost four years ago. Uh, Actually, next month, April of 2018, it'll be four years um, that I I started doing this because I actually started this in April of 2014. Which, when I, I, as you all know, for those listeners who've been with me for a while, I actually got passed over for a promotion, and I said, you know what, I just got, I'm going to use that as a kick in the ass and do start doing stuff creatively, because for a while there, I wasn't doing anything. I was, you know, putting together pitches. I was doing all sorts of different things, and nothing was going anywhere. I was getting frustrated. I, I was getting burned out, and nothing was happening. You know, it's all just spinning your wheels in the mud. So I figured, you know, what, what's the, what's something I can do? And I started another podcast that fell through. So I said, hey, I'm going to. Start my own podcast. What's the worst that can happen, right? And here we are, two hundred and eight episodes later. My God, where the hell has the time gone? But in this episode of the of the podcast, we're going to be talking about all that good stuff. We're going to be talking about filmmaking, starting your own podcast, how my guest started his own podcast, some of the guests he's had on. He actually had a really cool guest, and we're going to talk about that. A guest named Paul Knight came onto his podcast, and he was actually involved in one of the largest tax frauds uh, in UK history. Uh, He got pulled into it um, just about when he was trying to make his movie, and Paul's an interesting guy, too. He used to be a debt collector uh, for some underground, you know, mafioso types in in the UK, and uh, he got pulled into this. I mean, it's just so interesting, and, um, you know, who knows? Maybe I'll I'll invite Paul to come on this podcast sometime uh, just to to hear his story. It's just absolutely amazing, but... uh, but make sure you, you, you check out my next guest uh, podcast as well. He's a really good guy. He's got a, a movie out called The Dare. Without further ado, this is episode 208 with guest Giles Alderson. <laughs> Oh, absolute pleasure, Dave. It's a real pleasure. It really is. So you're you're a fellow podcaster. Uh, I, I, we actually met through the power of Twitter, which is how I meet a lot of how I meet a lot of people. Uh, you know, it, it's just great to connect. So uh, you know, and, and again, thank you for coming on and and you know wanting to come on. So 
Pleasure. You know, I, 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 and again, we're glad we could connect. And and so, just to get started, you know, I want to get talking about what brought you into the into the film world. You know, like me, you know, <laughs> you you made that you make that big step into, into going not only into doing film but starting a podcast. So there's two mm. mis- there's two big mistakes that both of us have made. <laughs> totally straight away, rule one hundred and one: don't do either of those things. But yeah, no, obviously that's why we want to do it in the first place. We want to make films. What started me off? I was an actor for years, so I've luckily managed to be in some kind of big movies over here and they did some of them came over to the states and did places and that um did reasonably well but they didn't make a difference for me you know when you, you're acting you think right i've got this big movie everyone's talking about how good it's going to be and the phone's never going to stop ringing the phone didn't ring at all and i think it was a big mistake from my end i wish someone had told me this beforehand and if any actors out there are listening it's don't expect anyone to give you a call after a movie comes out or so you think you're going to be the next big thing or even think you're going to get another job after it. You've constantly got to put the work in and get a PR agent, sell yourself constantly. It's a horrible business, but that's what you have to do. No one, most people don't go watch movies in cinemas, certainly not um, producers as making stuff. They get screeners for free. So when it comes out in the cinema, yeah, no one's going to be watching it. So that was a huge lesson for me. Um, I'd kind of put all my eggs in one basket this film came out called I Want Candy and I was like right that's it now you know it's going to be the next American Pie it's going to be huge for me and it wasn't the film just sort of died a bit of a death uh it was Neeling Studios movie as well so it was like huge press behind it was on billboards and buses everywhere and you're like right this is it no um just didn't happen so that's that was sort of my start you know in terms of making stuff it was obviously not that easy I was doing Shakespeare around the country and doing some terrible plays in some small fringe theatres above some pubs around London for a long time and put I was putting on my own plays as well I was always writing stuff and creating stuff and uh yeah I I we'd written a, a sitcom for the BBC I say for the BBC it wasn't for the BBC we'd written a sitcom it happened to get into the BBC's hands they said look cool make a little pilot off your own back if we like it we, we might be interested uh and we were all going to be in it um but the director pulled out last minute and i sort of said well i'll do it and i don't like i said i'd always direct directed plays that i'd written and suddenly now i'm i'm directing this tv sitcom i have no idea what i'm doing and i fell in love so hard i was like this is incredible um to make something so creative and 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 have the feedback and have the feeling of working with actors and telling my dp james friend right where do i want the camera to go and how do i want it to look and them just doing it It was like, yeah, that's even better than I thought. And suddenly I was, yeah, I was a director and I was like, how do I do this as a career? And that is the, the next challenge. Yeah, that, that is the challenge, right? How do you actually make a living doing this without going broke? Exactly. Yeah, that's, that was the hard thing. So I carried on acting for a, for a quite a while after that, doing adverts and other TV and other movies and stuff. And slowly over that time, learned how to be a director, a film director and TV. Well, I haven't done much TV yet, but, um, learn how to make stuff and that was fascinating it was a real journey and really interesting and uh yeah it took a long time and now i'm here doing it full time and it's yeah it's it's a wonderful thing but it's so hard as you know it's just not easy you've really got to work hard at it um and we set up the podcast the filmmakers podcast to the same as you we just wanted to get our voice out there and say look these are the things we're doing but if we can learn from other people at the same time, other filmmakers, which we get on and talk to, uh, very similar to yours, as ours is very British, um, and therefore I can learn something from it and at the same time promote some of our movies and get our voices out there and get heard. Um, so that was the idea behind it. But it's, yeah, it, it takes time. But again, it, <laughs> you, you, some sort of success comes from it in some way. The more you keep doing it, the same as you, what, episode two hundred and four five now it's huge it's huge right yeah it, it's just I, I sometimes i look at it and i go my god have i been doing it for this long like I know. what the yeah. hell what the how many years have you been doing it uh since 2014 so uh four years we're actually april 2014 is when i started so we're closing in on four years 
Oh my god! Well, congratulations. Seriously, I know I know how hard it is. You know, but it's putting it out. People think, oh, you do a podcast, just record it and stick it up. No, no, no. There's so much goes into it, right? Everything from editing it, bagging and tagging, putting all the music. Then you've got to get it uploaded to the various sites, and then you have got to promote it and get people to listen. It's it's a full time job, right? Yeah, it, it, you know, and I always say that barrier to entry to to get into podcasting is very low. But to make a mm. good podcast is very high because yes. I, I used to have a friend of mine. He would go, oh, you know, who cares? It's the Internet. Nobody cares about the audio. I, I go, you know, and I saw him recently and he goes, well, you were right. Everything has changed because even like the low grade podcast, so to speak, you know what I mean? Like podcasts that just mm-hmm. started or podcasts that whatever, you know, he's like the, the, the expectation is is that has to be of a certain quality. And, and that that keeps checking upwards now. That bar keeps mm-hmm. going a little bit upwards because people are going, OK, we don't want you to use your laptop mic anymore they want you to you know buy some at least you know a a snowball or a blue yeti or or the the, you know something of quality you know yeah absolutely and when i started the filmmakers podcast i wanted to make sure that the sound quality was high so i i I got i booked a studio i paid for a studio with an engineer for my first three episodes recorded them pretty much back to back but that way i knew it would sound good Rather than us lot trying to record it over Skype and having problems in in that sense at first, I was like, no, no, you need to understand how to do this. So, yeah, and the competition's high. You know, yours was up there when I was um, researching podcasts. I was like the Dave Bullis podcast, you know, and there's a couple of others that were, and they were the ones that I aimed to be as good as, you know, and that that's it's testament to you, but it's also there isn't many that are that good. Um, there are lots out there, but there isn't many that are that good and that keep people interested and entertained and have the right guests on and yeah you know, that takes time oh thank you very so, much i appreciate that pleasure. no problem so honestly I, I honestly it's a great podcast you do and it is inspiring for a lot of people so that's when when you said you want to come on i was like yeah of course of course you're kind of in a way how it all started for me so um yeah it's it's an honor Oh, well, hey, if I can expire one pe- person, right? It was all, no, seriously, it was all worth hey, it, you know? Exactly. I say exactly the same thing. Inspire one person. If I, I'm doing the podcast and we inspire one person to get up off of their ass and make the film that when they're 80, they regret not doing. And now they're going, do you know what? I am going to do it. And if we can do that, then that's an amazing achievement. It really is. It, it's, yeah, it's, it, it's a good platform. It's a good medium to, to share and to, talk about how hard it is to make films but at the same time you can do it you really can there's a lot of success stories now and that's nice yeah and 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 just to talk about your podcast i I know you've had uh you know uh some really interesting people on there so you know what what are some of the things that you've learned or you've experienced with starting your podcast like even when you first started it i mean Mm. you know did you do a lot of research to you know find out what mics to get and all that other good stuff yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've researched them all, watched all the videos, listened to all the best, like yourself, um, and just sort of went, okay, how do I want to do this? Um, and yeah, look, looked into all the mic things and went, oh my God, there's so many options. There's so many options of how to record it, what platform to put it on. It's just too much. I was very lucky. I had a guy called Jason Sanderson, who's kind of my podcast guru in the UK. He kind of edits for some big ones like Gnome Crawl um and other places like that so i was like okay if he can help me in any way and he was amazing he just said you know don't put it out straight away don't put it straight on itunes put it on a smaller platform first even if it's just your website for people to listen to get to know you and then when you put on itunes it will have a following already and it can get up the charts and do well and and we did and we got to number two which was incredible in the charts at the time and that was just from trying to do it the right way um but I think I think I've mainly learnt loads from the people we like I say we've had on. We had Mark Strong, you know, actor from The Kingsman, and he talked about working with Ridley Scott, hands-on approach, and Danny Boyle, and you kind of like you don't get that every day. And what yours is, and what ours, it's a free film school. It's it's an incredible thing, and it's uh, yeah, it's an amazing we can get good people on and talk to them, and yeah, I, I love it. We've got the um, uh, the Crown director who did all the the, the big. Uh, episodes he's on coming up and uh yeah just and i love talking to these people because they're doing what you do they're doing what you want to do is make films and make tv and um how can you not learn from that and be inspired um i mean you've had some amazing guests on yours oh well yeah you know it, it's i found that networking 
even through Twitter really, really helps out. You know, you mm-hmm. never know if, if you just reach out to somebody what they're going to say um, one way or another. And, you know, when I first started, I mean, see, you're already way ahead of me because when I first started, you know what I did? I actually, this podcast, and I, I started other podcasts, but just with this one, I, yeah. you know, I, again, I thought that that barometer was going to be so low. I, I didn't take a, into a, account of a pre-launch. So then other podcasts that, I, that I've, you know, I've, people that I've met, you know, podcasts mm-hmm. that I've listened to, they're, they've described how they launched. And I'm like, see, you know, they put some thought in, into this because my mine, I was like, you know what? Screw it. I said, I'm not, I'm just going <laughs> to put it out there, man. And, and, you know, with the, with what they were doing, it was like a pre-launch for a crowdfunding campaign. They already had an email mm-hmm. list they had. And so when they launched, they got, they got big on the iTunes already. They were already like, you know, in the news and noteworthy. And yeah. and now I kind of know the, how to do that. And, but you know, I was yeah, at the time you didn't, but yours was four years ago when it wasn't that not everyone was doing it. And certainly yours was the first of its kind that I knew of. And certainly that's still going now. Um, so you didn't know back then. There was no one telling you how to do it or even any YouTube videos saying this is the best way to podcast because it was so new. Now there's thousands of videos on how to do it and how to get it out there. Um, and it's just being clever, I think, um, and just really working out. If you're setting one up now is, yeah, really think about how you're going to do it. Who's your audience and what's your show about? If you have a little hook, then that's great. I get emails quite regularly now from people saying, I want to set up my own podcast. Can you give me some advice? And the main one is, Make sure you know what your show's about. Make sure you know what your show's about and have that hook and work on your strategy as how you're going to release it. Otherwise, you'd, you know, you're up against every other podcast out there and that's that's tough when you, you know, you're not getting many hits or views, listens, and you're there working really hard to try and you know, get it out there and get it listened to. It's quite demoralizing. So, yeah, work on it. Same as making a film, same as um, uh, putting anything out there is you've really got to work hard at it, work work your socks off and your ass off to make sure it's the best it can be before you deliver it to anyone. Um, that would be my advice. I, I thought the advice would be just don't do it. Just that would be, <laughs> save well, yourself. That was it as well. There is that as well. I have said that. I've said, look, this is really hard. You know, look, if, if you've really got to want to do it, you can't do this half ass because it's so hard and maybe you shouldn't do it. I might have put some people off by that, but it it is really hard. It's not easy podcasting. It's not. Yeah, it, it has it definitely has its ups and downs, and uh, <laughs> you, you know, and, and you know, when, when I was starting, and and you know, and for everyone listening, you know, this this really is, I mean, such empirical. I mean, it's it's not even hypothetical. I mean, this is ever, you know, uh, uh, what what Giles and I have gone through, and um, it, it it's just, I remember when I first started, and I had like. Uh, you know, 10 downloads here, five downloads here. Yeah. And yeah. then I finally got to one. Now this, this is a crazy story. So I, I mean, this is kind of out of left field. I had on a guest and I saw the podcast numbers for one day and I said, this has to be wrong. Like I must be still mm. dreaming or something. Yeah. Something's not gone through. There's no, um, yeah. Why isn't it? Show me more. Yeah. Well, no, 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 it was the exact opposite. Cause like I had this one podcast guest on and his numbers were, so out of into the atmosphere, I was like, "No, I have something has to be wrong here," and uh, that was Sean Baker who did oh, um, yeah, uh, Tangerine. Yeah, 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 which you've just put back on again. Yeah, absolutely, he's uh, it's fantastic. Yeah. yeah, and so so uh, that came out, and all of a sudden, I was like, "You ever see those old cartoons where like you know they 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 have to rub their eyes constantly because they couldn't?" Even, you know, <laughs> that was me. I was like, "What the hell?" And I'm and, and you know, and then I I ended up I'm like, maybe I should start doing this a little bit more better you know what i mean so like i started kind of getting into it a little bit more and more and it's just you know this is you know it's kind of can't, can't it's all come to this so you know where you're you're going to be episode like 207 208 and uh yes. you know it's it's just uh you know we're, we're just going to keep going until the wheels fall off this thing <laughs> totally and that's it keep going is another thing as well if you are going to do it and you keep going you keep going suddenly something changes those people who were listening regularly stay listening they become your loyal fans and you have loyal Loyal fans and they they will listen to you and they'll take it on board and and that's an incredible platform when you can get that far definitely definitely yeah it's good it's uh it's a fun it's a fun place to to sort of put your feelings out especially doing what we do because we can talk about the filmmaking world and 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 everything that's going on in our lives at the time and how we can make films better and yeah i think it's uh, yeah, it's a wonderful platform. It's the, it is the place to be at the moment in terms of getting your voice and your films heard is podcasting. So um, I did it just at the right time. I think if I started now, I'd be like, oh, I've just missed the boat. 
but I feel like I did it at the right time and we're uh, we're up and running and it's good. It's good. So, so you know, just talking about you know your podcast and all the stories and stuff like that. You know, what are, what are some of the stories that you've heard from different guests that have really just stood out? Because I mean, I've heard some stories too that I'm just like, holy crap! You know, I mean, you know, mm. and just and just exchanging all these stories, you start to really see like you know there are some really loony loony bins out there, man, who just yeah, you know, so many. Yeah, no, we've had a guy on recently called Paul Knight, and I don't know if you heard about this story, but his. Uh, he made a film for, we was told, for about 100 grand. It turned out that the producers were doing a huge tax scam and were telling the Inland Revenue here, which is the HMRC, the government, that they were making a nearly £20 million film so that they could claim all the tax rebate back. So it, they, they were doing this scam constantly and they just kept rolling around this 100K so they got found out by the um, the Indian Revenue, found out that, hang on, this, this this isn't right. So they said, oh, shit, we better make a feature. Let's do it. So they gave this guy, Paul Knight, 100 grand and said, go make the feature film. He went and made it, actually made it for 86,000. And when he delivered it, that's when it all came out. Um, the four producers went to prison, I think, for a total of I say, a, a lot of years. So they went to prison. Um, it's an incredible story. It, he, it, now, seven years on, he is just releasing that film. He's managed to get it back, get the ownership back. And obviously he was dragged through this. And he was a bit of a, a, a bad boy when he was younger as well. So he was in and around the prison system. So they just presumed he was part of it. But he had nothing to do with it. It's incredible. It's the first time he was legit. And suddenly all these people around him were just, just terrible monsters, these wannabe. And they didn't even care about film it by the sounds of it. And, um, yeah, they all went to jail except him. And, like I say, he managed to wrangle his film back called A Landscape of Lies. Do check it out. It's going to be out soon. And it's good for him, man. That's It was such an inspiring story. I, I had to put it into two parts. It was that good. Uh, and, you know, he's talking about the police, people banging on his door, the ups and downs of it all, of, of and the, the, the hell that he went through. He got blackballed as well. No one would work with him for four years at all. So he had to go under a different name because of it. It was huge in this country. Really big story. It changed the tax laws in this country. Um, so his story was amazing. And like I say, it's inspiring that he still managed to do it. And very recently, he just made a new movie as well. So um, that was one of, I mean, in terms of independent filmmaking and stories, you don't get much bigger than that. So that was great to have him on talking about his journey. Uh, have you had any as bad as that? Or is it um, mixed? Um, I So... Well, actually, first off, I just want to say I'm glad you brought that up because mm. I actually I saw that as I was going scrubbing through my Twitter and I saw you actually you know tweeted that out about the insurance scam and mm. I I always go you know what I I was just sitting there looking at the cover art and I said to myself if this is what I think it is. I said, I think that this this in itself would be a movie or, uh, yes. you know, a, a filmmaker trying to go good. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. He, okay. You know, he's had a you know bit of a rough past. He tries to go good and he's sucked into this other world now where these yeah. people are all trying to <laughs> steal and cheat steal and lie. And cheat. Yeah. Yeah. And, 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 and he's, and, and he's left on like the lurch for all this stuff. And then it's like, what the hell? You're trying to do the right thing. And man, you're still yeah. getting pounded back. I know. Oh, no, he was gutted. He was. I mean, you could hear it in his voice when he talks about it. He's still, it's still painful for him. But do you know why I like it so much? Is because he didn't give up. He just didn't give up. He went, I don't care what anyone. Then he's a proper London geezer as well. And I'm surprised they chose him because he's a big guy. He's a big lump, and he could, you know, it's it's not someone you want to mess with generally. So why, you know, why not? choose a smaller weedier filmmaker to make your film in that sense he just he, he, he'll go back and knock on your door do you know what i mean he's, <laughs> he's one of those guys so I, I, again it's an incredible story and it's so worth the listen um because just hey you know all those things that could go wrong went wrong for him um you know he'd made m movies for about a grand before that he'd made a whole feature for a grand or whatever or shorts for it and suddenly he gets 100k and he's like all my dreams come true you know, I imagine that some filmmakers listen to this and go, that's so low budget. It really is. But for him, it was like, this is all the money in the world and I can actually make a feature film for it. Um, 
Oh yeah, absolutely. Especially when you yeah. consider like you know you, you you look at some of these hit indie film man uh, hit indie film movies, and you mm. you look at like Blair Witch Project, which was yeah. what like fifty, uh, Paranormal yeah. Activity, which was like thirteen, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Kevin Smith's Clerks were shot for like thirty grand. That's right. Yeah. I mean, so so yeah. you you know it is possible. I mean, because you know I, I think there is a lot of filmmakers out there, um, and, and this is kind of something I've talked about before. You know, if I was if I ran a movie studio. And, and and I was actually saying to myself, look, we have all these superhero movies, right? What mm. if we just took $100,000 and legitimately tried to find the next Quentin Tarantino or whatever? Yeah, Robert Rodriguez. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. And, and just say, hey, here, look, here's, here's $100,000. Because if they lose that, you know, what the hell's $100,000? You know, to them, nothing. Yeah. It's nothing. It's their coffee bill for the week, you know? It really is. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. In, that, in those high-end world, it is. It's such a... Why not? Let's take a gamble. I think there is some offshoots of studios that do do it, but there's this impression of making a low-budget film for that much money. Therefore, it's going to be rubbish. It could be dreadful. Um, And I know you've talked about as well in your podcast in the past as well as um, uh, Project Greenlight, you know, and how they did that. But even there was there was big budgets for those movies. They were saying, oh, no, we can't make it for a million. And we're all watching the telly going, yeah, we can make that for a million. Of course we could. We make ours for a lot less. That's how that's indie filmmaking. You make it for whatever budget is there at the time. And obviously you want more because you could get bigger names in it, which then sell your film, which is kind of what it's all about. The end result um, and actually getting people to see it. Because this is something we talk about on the podcast a lot. Is look, go out and make your movie. I've got this hashtag going called make your movie. Um, oh, I've even forgotten it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> make your film in 2018. And it, it's, it's great. It's wonderful because hopefully it's inspiring and people will go do that. But the harder part is, which we don't talk about enough and we really should, is actually selling it afterwards. Because people can go make a film. You can go pick up an iPhone. Tangerine, Sean Baker is a perfect example of that. You can go do it. Um, even though he actually was really interesting, he didn't have to. Um, but uh, that what it is a, the end result is about selling it and for people to see it. And if people can't see your movie, they don't know how to get hold of it, or it's just not in their radar. It doesn't matter how much blood, sweat, and tears went into making the film. It is all about selling it at the end of the day and getting people to see it. So it's understanding the distribution side of it, uh, that all those, all that. It's huge, huge. Um, do you do you distribute it yourself? Do you bring a company in where therefore you might not make any money? Very unlikely you will. Um, yeah, so so it's a whole world. It's a whole different world, and uh, it's but but people can do it now, and that, that's what's great about it. You can make a film on your iPhone, and you can sell it yourself, and you can make money. I've seen people do it. Um, so I'm with those guys. Let's do it. Let's just keep making films. Keep. Keep sticking it to the man, if you like, <laughs> until we get a knock on the door from the studio films. Like, oh, yeah, no, I'd love to. <laughs> yeah, you're like, I always loved you guys. You know, <laughs> exactly. I, <laughs> no, you were my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> you, you know, that actually happened to a friend of mine. Yeah. Um, th- dead serious. He actually, this is when YouTube, uh, and I know I've told this story before in the podcast, but but I'll tell it again. Uh, so I, I had a, uh, a friend of mine in the inf- infancy stages of YouTube. He actually made a, a zombie film. And it was like a zombie trailer, um, and he was he was just about done making it. I think I want to say he's like maybe about seventy five, eighty percent of the way done. And he got a message uh, from off of YouTube, and it was like, "Hey, you know, my name is blah 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 from Lionsgate. Would you be interested in talking with me?" What? Well, yeah. He he calls him. He calls him up, and the guy was like, "I'm a, I'm a legit, uh, you know, from Lionsgate." He goes, "And we, you know, my I showed my trail or I showed your trailer to my boss. They want to actually." you know, talk to you about buying the rights. So he calls his business partner and they're like, well, well, I guess we gotta get a lawyer involved. So Lionsgate makes the offer, um, Mm -hmm. legitimately of, of, I think it was like 50,000 for the idea. And there was like, and, and, uh, something else. And they, they said, we want more than that. Um, so so, yeah, so, so, (laughs) so, so they asked for, uh, uh, so then Lionsgate came back with a hundred K and then they and my my friend was like, well, I also want to have a producer credit, and uh, you have to look at something else that I'm doing or something like that. Lionsgate okay. made one final offer. They said 100k. We'll look at what ever else you have, and no producer credit. And my friend walked away from the table. And, oh my god! Yeah. Oh my god! It's horrible. Oh god! 
And uh, he actually sometimes he would see, he says to me, he goes, you know, sometimes Dave, I sit there and I wonder what would have happened if I had taken that off. I was going to say, surely there's a, there's a good part of the end of this story where he goes, well, don't worry, I made it on my own and it was, um, you know, goodwill hunting and I made lots of money. No, you know, oh, that's, that's really sad, isn't it? The, there's the, a point, there's a point when you can get too greedy and think that you're too big time. At the end of the day, they, they'll just go, cool, forget it. We'll just go rewrite it with someone else, yeah. you know? And what are you going to do about it? it? I had a project like that that we'd written for a TV thing, uh, a TV idea. And, uh, you know, um, as we're developing it and we'd been putting it around some shops like BBC and, and Sky and places like that. And then suddenly the next thing we know, there's a production being made of, a, of the same story. And what do you do? Do you, got a ha- do you go sue them? Well, that's a lot of money. Yeah, what? It's really tough, and this will happen. So if someone does offer you money to go make your film and money to take your idea, you really, you really can't turn that down. It's a credit. It's huge. You, you've got an agent from that. Your next step, you, you know, ah, oh, yeah, he must be gutted. So, uh, <laughs> and the story actually got worse from there because oh, he, <laughs> he, <laughs> he, uh, he ended up, the movie never got finished. Yeah. Um, then he had an end because uh, cause he, he and his business partner couldn't just get on the same page. Then an editor took the movie and almost and it pretty much held it hostage. Uh, and then from there, they never actually finished the movie and he doesn't make movies anymore. Oh, see, you see, that breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. If he'd taken that deal and you know it and I think everyone else listening knows it, you take that deal. You, you forget the producer credit. Fine, I, I take the story. Whatever, he could now be doing. You know, making movies in this industry. It's, it's sad. It really is when you hear stories like that. It, it reminds uh. me of the episode of Seinfeld. I don't know if you've ever seen uh, uh, Seinfeld, yeah. but you remember when when Kramer was getting that settlement from the coffee people, and uh, before they could even announce their whole offer, he goes, "I'll take it." And his, <laughs> and, and, his and his lawyer was like, "You didn't even let him finish the sentence." He goes, oh, <laughs> "That's what okay. I, that's what I would have been like." I, as soon as they would have said, "Like we're going to offer you," <laughs> yeah, we'd gone. Yep, yep, yep. Thank you. That changes your life in that moment. You know when you. Uh, Writers and screenwriters and filmmakers, we don't often have lots of money, you know, with 50K. You take it. Oh, it's nice. They came out with 100. Bang. Arm bitten straight off. Do you think it was the lawyers that had a big influence on that? Um, I, I do not. I actually know the guy. I think it was just it was it was just an ego thing. Oh. No, no. This is a lesson for anyone listening, isn't it? This is a lesson. Just take, take. Then when she won you something, then you can have negotiation. You just, just, oh, yeah, sad times, sad times. But, um, <laughs> no, really, you you're absolutely right, because 50000 $50, dollars, fifty thousand pounds, fifty thousand euros. I mean, that's life changing. That's absolutely life changing. Yeah, and you could take ten of that and go and make amazing short, or a really amazing short. You could actually make a feature, you know, if you wanted to, or spend the year writing a load of other projects. With that money, you don't have to work for, well, all right, less than a year, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> but that's huge. Yeah, you could get in the room with a lot of people after that offer. Um, well, there you go. But uh, I hope he's not listening to this because he'll be crying into his cornflakes. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> he'll be on the train somewhere going, no, no, I know, I know, stop it. <laughs> he, um, he actually, uh, he doesn't make movies anymore now, so I, 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 you know, I, I've kind of fallen out with him. Um, not like because a, of that. <laughs> well, no, 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 not because like a bad thing or anything. It's just, like, you know, yeah. we haven't, we just, you know, don't really talk that much because we don't really interact that much because um, he stopped making films. But, um, you know, I mean, you know, I'm sure eventually he and I will end up talking again and, uh, you know, see what see what's going on. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, you know, absolutely. And hope that inspire him back to doing it again, you know. Yeah. Wow. Or maybe you take his idea, you know, <laughs> as in bring him with you. Um, but like, you know, make it with him if it's that good an idea. I'm sure they've since made it in a studio game or whatever. Um, if it was that good. Bless him. Not good. Um, but, yeah, no, like the say the podcast great because we. I, w- I do it with fellow filmmakers. So I've got Andrew Roger, who's a cinematographer, Dan Richardson, who's an actor and producer, and Christian James is a director. And the, the four of us, we I, I kind of run it, but we get those three on whenever I can, whenever they're free and not working. Uh, and suddenly we talk about our filmmaking stuff, and we've become really close because of it. And we can all swap scripts and ideas, and it's it's been been a really wonderful thing. Um, I've also got to meet some producers I never would have met 
um, because of it, uh, a God's Own Country producer, which is up for the BAFTA tonight. Um, so hopefully it will we'll win, which obviously when this comes out, we'll know whether they've won or not. And, and Jack Tarlin, the producer of that, came on the podcast. I'd never have met him. And since I've now sent him a, a project and talking to him about stuff, he's really interested and keen to hear stuff. So it's that's that's invaluable. That's huge for someone like me who's a filmmaker to meet these kind of people anyway. Not that I'm abusing it, but if they ask you, you kind of go, well, yeah, sure, please, please have a look and something can happen. Um, I got offered a, a, a potential movie from it, from doing it as well. They've obviously seen my work. It wasn't that easy, but, you know, they they became aware of me from doing the podcast and, and suddenly they're going, oh, we've seen your stuff now and cool, can we talk to you about this film? So, yeah, it's been it's been invaluable doing the Filmmakers Podcast, without a doubt. So good. I imagine the same with yours. I imagine that it's opened a lot of doors. Yeah, you're like, hey, aren't you that guy who has that terrible podcast? And I'm like, I am. <laughs> that is me. <laughs> you went, yay, terrible <laughs> podcast together. <laughs> I was like, yeah, right. It is. I am that guy. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but, yeah. but just hearing some of the stories that I've heard, you know, just going back to that, I mean, like um, the, the, the crazy Aziz story that, that I had um, – uh, I don't know if you heard that story, but it was actually, I think it was episode 98. Um, oh God, I forget. I, I forget what episode it was, but essentially there was a, um, there was this professor at, uh, I think it was USC or UCLA. I, I, by the way, this is a great story I'm telling, by the way, I'm like, I can't remember all the details, but I think it was like this happened. And, <laughs> great story. Great yeah. story. Yeah. <laughs> I live up to that bad podcast moniker, man. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, you're the guy who never can remember anything. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's me. It. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, so what happened was the, the, this guy, he was, he ran the equipment department at, at, at either USC or US, UCLA. And he ran the, he was like the head of the equ- equipment rental. And they said, whenever you, you'd bring something back, he would always, grill people he'd be like you know what the hell this wasn't like this and you know people kind of knew he was a little off kilter well he ended up Mm. writing a screenplay and uh johnny Depp ended up buying it wow and what happened was um so suddenly one day he goes he doesn't show up for work he just goes missing Uh, i'm sorry no before that he actually got fired from the school because he apparently a camera went missing and they blamed him for it and huge blowout he got fired um, what, so, what went missing? A counter? A what? A camera. Oh, a camera. Sorry, sorry, a camera. Okay. So, uh, so, so what happened was, so a camera went missing, and he got he got blamed for it, and you know a fight ensued, and he he got fired. So, flash forward about a week later, um, they they find his wife and child dead, and he he was completely missing. Oh God! Well, they find out that he actually did it. And he actually suddenly now the school had to get extra protection because there were people were saying, oh, my God, you know, he, he had a, a vendetta against me. What the hell is going to happen here? Is he going to come to the school? Is he going to what, what the hell is going to happen here? Mm. They end up finding him dead in the woods because he committed suicide. So wow. Johnny Depp ends up making the movie on that script and ends up premiering it at the Cannes Film Festival and the movie bombs. And he actually has still to this day never released the film. No way. True story. Wow. 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 What's the film called? Can you remember the film? So, uh, if you, uh, I'm actually going to look it up really quickly because it's an IMDb. Uh, if you look up IMDb and then Johnny Depp, I think it's his only, I, I'm pretty sure it is his only directing credit. Uh, let me just actually pop this up real quick. That's brilliant. It's, it's Pirates of the Caribbean, maybe? <laughs> <laughs> no, one's, no one's seen it. It uh, could be could be loads. Guy's done so much work. It's um, it's such a uh, thing. Is with Johnny Depp. He is one of these comedians that ev- everyone in the kind of world knows who he is. Mm-hmm. But yet, people are kind of. Well, I don't know if I want to go see a Johnny Depp movie at the moment. It's really strange, especially all the stuff that happened um, recently and the Fantastic Beasts sort of story as well. It's 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 a real shame um, because he's, he's he's a wonderful chameleon actor. But he just again like Leonardo DiCaprio wanting to get away from his good look image and sort of play these weird quirky characters all the time 
Um, yeah, and I, I think with with Leonardo, I, th- I think he's more like if you saw like Django Unchanged, he he's more of or even the Revenant, you, you see things more in terms of he's actually trying to expand his acting range. Um, with, with to me with, with sometimes with Johnny Depp, I, I think sometimes he just likes to play these quirky characters. Uh, you ever see mm. you ever see uh, Life's Too Short with uh, Warwick Davis? Of course, it's a British show with <laughs> yeah. Ricky Gervais. Yeah, yeah. And he comes great. on and he's just like you know the he, and Ricky's like grilling uh, Johnny Depp and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. And I thought that was just hilarious because they were doing a yeah. rumple skilt skin and uh you know Johnny was gonna play a dwarf and, <laughs> <laughs> and he's sending himself up basically. And that's kind of cool. I, I like that. Yeah, I like he's sending himself up. And um, was the movie called The Brave? By yes it chance? was. Right, okay, good. Right. So, yeah. <laughs> so so that that's the movie that, that had Johnny directed that he has never that's the only movie he ever directed and it, it still has not seen the light of day. because uh, apparently the people there who actually saw it just said it was it wasn't any good whatsoever. So um that, well, that had Marlon Brando in it. Yeah. <laughs> The, the story just gets crazier and crazier. It, it's just, it's, it's like, how on earth did this all happen? It's like... mm-hmm. yeah, these stories. There's so many filmmaking stories, the horror stories that you hear, um, of things going wrong and problems. Like you say, having guests on your podcast, you hear all these stories constantly. If they're successful now, they they weren't successful earlier, and you hear the stories of things that that happened to them or projects that got taken away and i've had that projects taken away um you know that you're working on you're working hard on and suddenly that it's not yours you you don't own the ip and goes oh i'm going with that producer now or um worse the producer you're working with goes behind your back and speaks to the writer's agent it all these things do happen and it's it's horrible it really is it's a really hard business um you've got to be tough skinned and you've got to really want it and you've got to fight hard yes. um to do it um, it took me I think, eight years from doing Barry Brown, which was the uh, TV sitcom, to actually making my first feature film. And all that time I was trying to make a feature film. And uh, last year I got to make The Dare, finally, which I'd written it as well with Johnny Grant. Um, he co-wrote it with me from an idea I had, two ideas I just stuck together. And all this time of trying to make other things, big sci-fis, and they all start off small. <laughs> they end up jason statham was attached to one. Oh, uh, nice nice yeah fox searchlight we're, we're, we're all behind it it was happening and then suddenly we don't hear from jason statham for six months and you kind of like you're waiting that whole time you're like yeah we're gonna make this film and you know all that time you're the problem you're the commodity because no one knows who you are you've not directed anything and they love your script and you've written it so they trying to take it off you and trying to sign rights away and next thing you know oh statham's passed and he's like but he was doing it. You put the offer on the table. He agreed. And suddenly now it's not. And the project disappears. It dies within seconds. And you, and then you'd start another one. You go, no, forget the big one. Let's go low budget. And you start off low budget again. You say, come on, we're going to make this for 100 grand. Let's just go make something so we're not the problem next time. And the budget goes up and up. Fox become interested again. And you've got this horrible circle. So with the dare, I was like, right, this time. Because there's, uh, there's other projects I'm still trying to make during this time. One called The Nobodies, which hopefully is going next, which is a fantastic drama. But it's a drama, so it's a problem trying to make a drama. They're like, unless you've got, you know, um, James McAvoy or in it, you, you're going to struggle. Um, so I was like, let's make The Dare. Let's make a horror where we, we don't need names. We can just shoot this in someone's shed if we needed to so that we can make a feature film. I can personally direct a feature film. And... Um, yeah, we, it, it it was the quickest of of a lot of my friends' projects that that happened. I think I wrote it. It took about eight months from me finishing the final script to it actually being in production. I know there's loads a lot quicker, but in terms of the budget we we ended up with was decent. It wasn't just in my shed. It was at New Boyana Studios in Bulgaria. It was Millennium Films were behind it, so it suddenly became a a big studio project, which is which was incredible. It was a real journey for me and it was amazing to make it. But even before the first day of shooting, I didn't think it was going to happen. I thought someone's going to go, someone's going to jump out and just say, ha, ah, this is a big joke. This is a wind up. Or someone's going to say, we haven't got the money or yeah, we, the, the actors can't make it. You know, it, this whole, I really just didn't believe it. I think what didn't help as well is we lost, I lost my first location the day before my first day of directing a feature film they just went yeah you can't shoot there anymore and it was just that was it uh, adrian brody was shooting there at the same time and they went no no he needs it they're shooting on there and i was like but i've prepped i'm i'm ready what we're gonna do and there was nowhere else available that 
it's just impossible. So anyway, obviously we found somewhere and it carried on, but it was it was it, it was an amazing amazing um, time for me. And looking back now, you, at the time was so hard. You, you, you've made films; it's so hard. Everything's going on in your head from uh, how you're going to shoot this certain section to the actor's performance. This goes on like it's like a whir in your head that just doesn't stop. You have to have the answer for everything. You have to be on high alert all the time. You cannot switch off. You just can't. You switch off, you miss something, that's it. People don't respect you. You lose your crew, uh, your cast. So you have to be on it. Um, But it was, looking back, it was an incredible, incredible thing. It was, um, yeah, beautiful to make and and so it should be released in the summer so very exciting very exciting you, you know that that's happened too to me, to me where we had a a location it's fallen out the night before and you're like well what changed why all of a sudden can we not yeah. shoot there and adrian brody got me too no i'm just kidding but <laughs> <laughs> that would have been amazing when adrian brody just popped around and went no no, no i'm sorry no you can't shoot there anymore you like, what <laughs> yeah oh uh, yeah, that was that was scary times. I remember ringing the producer up and sort of going, "Well, what do you want me to do?" Because I've got people flying over literally for this shoot. It was the it was the opening of the film. It was a stag do, which is actually totally rewritten now and reshot and changed the opening. But at the time, I had lots of friends who were flying over who could only be there for a day to shoot this stag scene. And I'm like, "Well, it's not like we can put it back because they're all they're flying in for the day and they're flying back. That's it." Um, but yeah, so at the time I was like, well, I, I don't know what to do. We're going to have to pull it. We, I, you know, you, we're going to have to find somewhere. We did find somewhere that wasn't too far in Adrian Brody's reach. So he couldn't actually hear us. <laughs> that was all right. We got away with it. Um, apparently he's a nice guy, but at that time I didn't particularly like him, but, um, <laughs> yes, um, that's how it works. Um, <laughs> studios isn't it yeah they yeah they 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 just you know hey look they need this and like well they're you know they'll be back and we want to make you know everyone you kind of in that situation they're always going to go with well look they're you know that's what we know is like a surefire bet um and that's that's almost that almost happened to me too because when i was done filming my tv pilot uh they're like look you got to break this down because emily shamlon and will smith are coming in here like right behind you to film after earth and i said yeah likely story they always the old (laughs) the old will smith uh yeah uh, excuse yeah. huh yeah exactly yeah will's coming in of course he is of course he is but he probably was i mean yeah it's the same thing and it, that's it you've got to sort of not know your place but that's how it works they're a big you know it's an adrian brody movie with john malkovich and um and some other big people in it and of course they're just gonna go well no we need that we're paying to be here you know you're an in-house production i'm sorry you're gonna have to move it and you you have to accept that and we did. We had to just go, OK, when you have to lie down and go, fine, you have to find somewhere else. And I, I walked around all day trying to find somewhere that would work for this stag do in the forest and that wasn't in Adrian Brody's earshot or their coming. I mean, it's a bit harsh on Adrian Brody here. It probably wasn't his <laughs> decision in the slightest. Um, but, uh, yeah, these things happen. These things happen. But, um, what if it was his decision though, and he was like, you know, you know what? I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna file, file find him, around, just uh, follow him, and every time uh, Giles makes a movie, I'm gonna make sure I'm in the vicinity <laughs> just to be checking off those boxes. You know, he's starting a podcast, by the way. Yeah, I'm uh, sure he is. <laughs> called the Filmmakers Podcast. Yeah, I'm sure he is. Or the Dave Bullis Podcast. He's doing one. It's, it's a mix. It's a hybrid. <laughs> he's always he's one step the- ahead. He is, yeah, oh, one step behind, but just jumping on us, just trampling me down. Now that actually, that would be quite cool. I wouldn't mind that. That'd be kind of a cool story, wouldn't it? You have this running feud with someone like Adrian Brody, <laughs> <laughs> and no one will believe you. That'd be the funniest part. No one part. would believe me. They'd be like, as if. Why would he do that to you? What What good is that for him? He's like, no, no, he's, he's just got this bee in his bonnet. He just he, just, he just doesn't like people called Charles. What can I say? I don't know. <laughs> So yeah. you, you you mentioned the movie uh, the, yeah. the Dare, and I want to get back to that too before I because I, I mean I, before I completely forget. But you mentioned the Dare, and it, it's coming out this summer. Uh, you know how, how are you releasing that film? Because I know we touched upon that earlier about you know what what way do you go? Do you do you release it yourself, or, or do you mm-hmm. go through a company? So so what what did you ultimately decide to do? Well, it was taken out of my hands a bit because it's a studio movie. They Millennium Films who did Expendables and London Has Fallen picked it up from the beginning it was part of the deal so they would distribute it if they'd done leatherface and they've just done uh george romero's remake of walk not i was gonna say walking dead the um 
Day of the you Dead. Know, a... Day of the Dead, thank you. Yeah, so they've just done those. So the, the horror stuff is happening at the moment for them. So they were like, cool, well, we'll take the dare. So it was kind of all sorted for me. I'm trying to be involved as much as I can. Um, but it is out of my hands in that sense. It's already, I don't have to self-distribute, though obviously I will be promoting it and doing everything I can when it comes out to, to get it in people's ears and minds and eyes. But um, yeah, for this one, it's out of my hands, um, which is amazing, which is that, wow, okay, if your first big one that you've been trying to make for ages, suddenly it's a studio movie and you don't have to sell it. You don't have to do all the things that I've been learning for such a long time about how I can actually get my movie seen. It doesn't mean that they won't necessarily push it as much as I would, but it's it means it's already got, you know, we've already sold in certain territories and it's already been, you know, uh, wanted. So that's really nice. It's a really nice place to be. But then the film I helped produce called A Serial Killer's Guide to Life, which is, uh, that again, should be out end of the summer maybe. That's, we're going to probably self-release that. Um, Staten Cousins Row and Poppy Cousins Row who made that. Um, yeah, that's that's going to be a totally different beast because that's totally independent, massively low budget in terms of, you know, movie, studio movie type thing. So, yes, that's been really interesting to, to really get your teeth into how to distribute that properly. It's all good and well listening to a few talks and stuff. But when you actually got a movie and you're going, OK, now I actually need to self-distribute this. How are we going to go about it? Um, it's really important you know everything and you understand the, the laws of this so yes we're, we're looking at all this at the moment there's some really good ones out there as well who uh, who's who can help you film hub seems really cool um jason brubaker's one's really cool so there's some really really good people out there who will help you self-distribute in the right way um but yeah no luckily with the dare i didn't have to do that or at the moment i don't <laughs> you never know, I might turn around and go, Giles, in the UK, it's up to you. Do what you want. <laughs> We're like, right, well, there's a few people listening to the podcast, so hopefully they might buy it and not stream it for free. You just never know, do you? <laughs> yeah, yeah you, you, you hope that, that you know, they'll, they'll, they could spend a couple of bucks. And uh, yeah, I, like, like Ashley Scott Myers, uh, he has his own podcast, too, called uh, Selling a Screenplay. And he just yes. made a movie called The Pinch. And I really want to make sure uh, that I, I like to not only to follow his journey of doing this, but also... Also, you know, he he has an audience that he's built up. Um, you know, he has all these you know things in place. I'm really interested to see. I mean, he got crowdfunded. You know, he he, he made his crowdfunding goal, and yeah. uh, I just want to make sure. Sh- I'm interested to see uh, when it's released. You know, if there's stragglers who are probably like, oh, you know, everyone makes a movie, but not everyone finishes a movie, and mm-hmm. you know, we don't want to invest in a movie that's not going to get got, not going to get made. And I've seen that happen too, by the way, with just different people because they, they they get a little gun shy now with crowdfunding because they've been burned. And and then all of a sudden they're like, well, when we see the movie, we'll buy it then. And, uh, you know, yeah. I, I think that that might that's probably sadly becoming the norm because there's too many filmmakers. Um, in fact, I've donated to some co- campaigns and they've raised like twenty, thirty thousand dollars for a short film and never mm. and never made the damn thing. What? Yep. Twenty, thirty K. Yes. That's huge. That's a huge amount of money for a short film. And they never made it. What did they do to give you the money back? What nope. happened? The, uh, the guy disappeared. <gasps> the, the one guy I know disappeared. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> that should actually oh. be a podcast. I should actually should track be. him That's, down and be should. like, what the hell? That's so sad. Uh, do you know what? It's people like that who shouldn't be allowed anywhere near our industry. It should be blackballed and we should make a proper thing of it. You know, like your Facebook page, people like that. It's like, do you know what? Any names like this, you don't go near them. Don't be involved. This is It's not fair. It's not fair for even you, you might have put $10 in. It doesn't matter. It was your time and effort of watching someone's, you know, Kickstarter or wherever it was page. Um, yeah, that's wrong. We, we we managed to raise the same thing for Serial Killer's Guide to Life. We did Kickstarter, or Indiegogo, um, and we raised, yeah, a decent amount on there uh, to make the film. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really powerful platform. If you do it right, if you know how to market the thing, because it's, as you know, it's really hard on a Kickstarter because the first two days you get all your mates, they might do it for the next two weeks. You've really got to push it um, yeah, to get people to same as getting people to watch your film. Yeah, or buy it. You've, you've, it's, it's a full time. Or listen to the podcast. It's a full time job. You've got to be, you've got to be pushing it out quite regularly. Yes. Um, yeah. 
it, yeah, it, it, it really is, man. And it, and it's just uh, I, I've told I've I've tried to coach other people when doing the the crowdfunding thing. Um, some people have have passed by the skin of their teeth. Um, I mean, wh- I, I'll tell you a, a quick one, really quickly, because I know we're starting to wind down. But um, mm-hmm. I had a friend of mine who was like four thousand dollars short, and it was like an hour left. And I woke up the next day, and he had gotten his goal. And I said, "What wow. the hell?" I said, "How the hell did you do that?" I said, "You didn't even like to promote it that much." And uh, he actually had he, – he was at a random party about two days before and somebody actually who, who he bumped into was willing to give him the difference if, um, if, if just like he could get a producer credit or something like that. And this was a, this was a film that was never going to turn a profit. And, wow. and this person just you know was an older person who had a pretty deep bank account and – that that was that, and I said, "Man, oh man!" I said, "You know, that's that's the that's the fairy godmother attempt at doing this, man." So you got lucky. Totally, you got lucky. I think if it gets to that point when you're a couple of grand short at the end, stick it in yourself. It's yeah. a case of you're going to get the percentage, whatever Kickstarter take taken off that, but at least you'll get the rest of the money that you've raised so far, rather than saying, "Oh, we can't." Yeah, let's let it all go because that's devastating. I've had a few friends who've done that. We got really close, and then we're like, "Look, let's just put the last five hundred quid in, and it's all done." Um, and I've had some that, with our one serial killer's guide to life, it went further. We got much more than we asked for, and then we upped it, and then we got more than that. So, and I've heard others that didn't get anywhere near it; they just failed massively. So, yeah, it's interesting, very yeah. interesting. Oh, I just want to um, mention who I've got in the dare. Um, some people might know who they are, especially in America, it's, which I think is really interesting because I cast a lot of these people maybe just before they were breaking out as well. And I think that's really important for producers and directors to find actors who are just about to go over the edge to being potentially a name, but, you know, to being much more successful. Um, so I've got Richard Brake who is in Game of Thrones, who's in Peaky Blinders, who's... So he's, like, super and a wonderful actor to be around. Actually, I, I lucked out with all my cast. I got my all my first choices, and, uh, yeah, that was through audition processing and everything. And Richard Short, who's up for a, uh, an Emmy on Oscar for uh, Mary Kills People, um, which is the big show in Canada at the moment, which is going to come across to America soon and hopefully the UK soon. And he was in vinyl. Um, Robert Marshall was in Mission Puzzle 6. Um, Bart Edwards, who's in Unreal. Um, so, yeah, I, and it's just been really amazing uh, to get that kind of cast. Harry Jarvis as well. He's doing big Disney shows. And, yeah, I, I think it's really important to get those kind of people Um in in your cast if you can and this was a horror so it's harder to get that but i think if you really push and sort of have a script that's not necessarily even though mine's gory it's a gory horror uh and i've been told it's not necessarily that hot at the moment but whatever is vampires weren't hot when twilight came out you know it's i'm not saying we're going to be the next twilight far from it but there's there is an audience there's always an audience for your film you just got to find them um, and I'm going on that hunt. <laughs> I'm going there with my blood and my gore, and I'm going to say, right, come on, watch this film. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be an interesting journey, that's for sure. It already has been. It's been crazy. crazy. Yeah, yeah, you know, they're always trying to sort of like, like, oh, well, that's not hot at the moment or whatever. And, mm. you know, it, it's like, well, if you're trying to do what's hot, by the time it comes out, they're going to be on to the next thing. So you're just trace, t- chasing a trend. You know, it's, it's kind of like super fake. You know what I mean? It's, it's kind of superfluous. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Of course it is. Yeah. The, the, as soon as something, like you say, Twilight came out, there was a whole host of vampire movies or um, it, it's just how it is. So hopefully there'll be a whole host of <laughs> more dark psychological horrors after the dare. Yeah. Because um, well, it's, it's kind of like when I, I had a friend of mine and she went out to pitch at um, AFM and she came back and and uh, she said the first thing they said was uh, people who were in horror, they were saying no no zombies, nothing but zombies. Mm. And uh, because The Walking Dead was out and, you know, well, then yeah. all of a sudden she went, uh, you know, I think maybe last year and then she said, oh, now they want zombie things again because Fear the Walking Dead came out and that, that was doing well <laughs> at the same time. And, you know, I'm like, Jesus God. No. Nobody knows, right? Yeah. Nobody knows. Yeah, they don't know. They're just following a trend and saying what their bosses want to hear, what them to hear. It's, it's, yeah. But I, my advice is make or try and make or write what you believe in. And if you want to make a, a film like Twilight, you want to make a film like some drama, make it. 
literally write it and go, do you know what? I don't care what's hot or not right now. This is what is coming out of me. This is what I believe in. And because of my belief, I'm going to go try and get it made. That's that's just you can't. I don't think you can follow trends or when people says, no, don't write that or change that. Don't have, uh, you know, the love scene. Don't have that, you know, put in what you believe and what's right for you. Um, and when someone offers you money, then you can change it. <laughs> <laughs> someone offers you 50K or 100K to take your idea, you'd let them take it. Do what you want with it. <laughs> it, 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 it that, that's a lesson, everyone, from this podcast. If someone offers it, you that money, you take it, or else Adrian Brody is going to steal your location. That's, <laughs> that's what to gather from this podcast. That's what to gather, yeah. What is it, 100K or Adrian Brody? What do you want? What do you want here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, uh, so Giles, just in closing, uh, I know we've been talking for about you know fifty five minutes or so now. Just is, is there anything in closing you wanted to say? Just sort of put a period at the, at the end of this whole conversation. Um, yeah, I suppose. Well, I don't know really. Um, I, I, uh, maybe uh, some things that I learned. Maybe just again, sort of a little bit of advice. But it was yeah, it was, it's a couple of things I got, which was when you're on set, don't rush. Don't even though someone's breathing down your neck and saying you've got to do this, you've got to do this. Is just take your time, get that second extra shot, trust your gut, um, and also think about the edit while you're shooting. Think about how it's going to be in the edit room. If you've got your ins and outs of when a character's walking in the room, they've left the room. Turn over for a little bit longer. Plan it all uh, and work your ass off. Because remember, no one cares as much as you do. Honestly, no one cares as much as you do about your film. They might pretend they do, and they're all behind you and they're with you, but it's your name on it. It's your passion, and they don't care as much as you. Yes, that is fantastic, my friend. And uh, where can people find you out online? Uh, I'm at Giles Alderson on Twitter. Um, my directing website is directed by Giles. Um, you can follow the podcast at Filmmakers Pod. Yeah, or uh, the filmmakerspodcast.com. That's where all our episodes are at. Yes, that's where you can find me. And I will link to all of that in the show notes, everybody, at DaveBullis.com. Twitter, it's at Dave underscore Bullis. And the podcast is at DB Podcast. Dallas Alderson, I want to say thank you so much for coming on. Absolute pleasure, Dave Bullis. It really is. Honestly, keep up the good work. I love your podcast. I love what you do. You're an inspiration to a lot of people. So keep going even through the hard times. See, that is awesome. Thank you so much, by the way. Uh, Pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you seriously, man. I, I really do appreciate it. And because uh, sometimes, you know, you, you, you put a podcast out there and you, you wonder, um, is anyone going to listen to it? Is, that, what is what anyone going to think of it? Uh, and you, you just kind of... You know, first time you do everything, uh, or first time you do anything, it's, it's going to be bad. Um, you just got to keep going out there and getting better and better at it. I mean, I, I you know, um, just for everyone listening, just as a final thought to this whole podcast, I mean, I, I know YouTubers right now who have like a 4 million uh, subscriber following and they go back and look at their first videos and it's just absolutely awful. And they mm -hmm. admit they and they admit it. And then now all of a sudden you flash forward a year or two later and they've they found their niche and they have like 4 million subscribers. And you're like, my God, what the yeah. hell? <laughs> How the hell that happened? Yeah. <laughs> It's keeping at it. It's keeping going and keeping strong and believing in what you're doing and getting better all the time as well. Don't hang back on your laurels if, you know, oh, why is it not working? No, no, get better. Learn from it and listen to people like Dave and, and really, yeah, work hard, especially if you want to do a podcast. Yeah, they can listen to me and figure out not, what not to do because I'm very, I'm very good at that. I'm very good at telling you something like, all right, I'm going to do the exact opposite of what everybody says. <laughs> hey, uh, but we change our minds. We're allowed to, right? Yeah. We're the hosts. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> uh, Love it. Again, Giles, have a great day, man. And uh, I, seriously, let, let, let's, let's reconnect soon, and I wish you the best luck with everything, dude. Thank you, Dave. You too. All the best. Find Dave at DaveBullis.com. Please make sure to subscribe and share the podcast.